we will defend this in the court of law, and that's what we're going to do. And when he has his opportunity to speak at the conclusion of the case, he will do so. Okay? Well, Thank you very much. I feel that they're unwarranted and shouldn't have been brought. All right, get out the gloves. Let's go to work. First up, she is the veteran columnist for the New York Post, former Wall Street Journal editor and writer, and author of the book, God Religion, How Churches, Mosques, and Synagogues Can Bring Young People Back. Let's welcome Naomi Schaefer Riley. And he is the man on the street for the Media Research Center, blogger, author, and who recently got students to sign a petition demanding the minimum wage be increased to 50 bucks an hour, meaning he'd make an excellent contract negotiator, by the way. Let's welcome Dan Joseph. I thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks, All right, Dan, let's go ahead and start with you on this one. This came out early today, Tulsa World, the newspaper there reporting that the individual who shot the unarmed man, the 73-year-old volunteer cop, apparently this newspaper's been inundated with sources that say his training records have been falsified. I have to tell you something that I commented on this a couple of days ago and talked about this just being one Yahoo sheriff who's basically selling a badge. If these accusations are true, what will this do to people's trust in law enforcement around the country? Well, I think people's trust in law enforcement around the country is probably at an all-time low right now anyway. It's actually very fortunate that race did not play a role in this, uh, because if that had happened, you know what the reaction would be. It would be much, much worse, and there would be a much bigger story. Uh, as for the cop himself, I do kind of feel bad for this guy. I, I mean, I think that he was a good guy. I don't think he, uh, he shot this guy out of malice. But you do have to raise the question also, what is a 73-year-old man doing on the police force in that kind of capacity. Uh, we have to start raising questions about it. it you know, he, he said he wrote, reached for his gun, in, or reached for his taser. Instead, he got his gun. Um, it, it, it's happened before, certainly, but is his age play any role in this? And if so, that's going to be a factor as well. Now, he apologized for it right away. I, I, again, I don't think he did it intentionally. But yes, the, the department, the police department there in Tulsa will bear the responsibility if, in fact, he did not have the required number of hours, uh, if he, in fact, bought off, bought his badge, as you said. I'm not sure if that's the case. Uh, I'm not going to try to try it here. Uh, you know, it shouldn't be tried in the media. Um, but it, at the same time, yes, it is very, very troubling if any of these allegations turn out to be true. Naomi, I'll tell you what, and again, uh, what Dan said here is right. The guy probably thought he was doing the right thing. He probably thought he was doing something worthwhile to help the community. And we don't want to hammer away at all of the great volunteer cops who are out there because th they really are a backbone of America because there's so many of them out there right now. But you've still got to wonder, Law enforcement has so much trouble right now trying to get some trust with people, and here's a guy who many people would say just bought his badge. And at 73, I think Dan's point is well taken. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and obviously there are reasons that there are rules in place for the professional police forces about age requirements and training requirements. And it's it seems plain that those rules were violated here. So, I mean, I, I, I get that people are, you know, have a low level of trust in law enforcement right now, but, you know, what we need to focus on here is the fact that you know, there were rules in place to prevent this, and they were broken, and you have corruption. And, you know, corruption in a government bureaucracy is not anything new, and it, it happens in police departments, too, unfortunately. Um, and I do think, but I do think you see this kind of issue where you have kind of parallel security forces come up often. I mean, in, in many cases, we see this come up on college campuses where you have sort of the campus cops and the police, you know, the real police, and they're trying to sort of, in some cases, do the same job. Their jurisdictions are not clear. And so, you know, in general, I think, you know, it's, it is really much more preferable, um, you know, to be relying on professional police forces. And it should be said that in all of the other cases that we have seen, uh, you know, recently where there's been controversy over police action, those have been in very professionalized police forces. Mm -hmm. Big city police forces these days are, you know, extraordinarily well trained. And so to sort of lump this in with those cases, I think is extremely unfair. Yeah, I think that's one thing that we all but have to be very sense, careful also, of. Please, the go fact ahead, Dan. That these I'm sorry. Cases have no, in a sense, the fact that these cases happened prior to this probably put a spotlight on the Oklahoma case, probably made uh, forced media and other journalists to investigate, which they might not have done otherwise. So in a sense, putting the spotlight on something like this, where you do have the opportunity to expose corruption, uh, may be one of the benefits of what has happened in places like Ferguson, places like New York City. Well, here's what happened, too, in the Tulsa case. The Tulsa World Reporter said the papers started hearing almost immediately from different sources that Bates' training records had been falsified, so they didn't even really have to dig for it. They've got people coming forward here, and I think that tells a lot about those people who are professionals and want to make sure that this profession 
nation is protected from people like this and issues like that. Please, both of you, stand by just a couple of moments here. We have to take a break, come back on the other side. And when we do, let's talk about security and protection of another kind, the flying bicycle and or gyrocopter, if you will, that wound up landing right smack dab where it shouldn't have been in Washington, D.C. That and more in the arena next. All right, back to work. Veteran columnist for the New York Post, Naomi Schaefer-Riley, and man on the street for the Media Research Center, Dan Joseph. And Naomi, this one comes to you first. The FAA is looking at the Florida mailman who landed his gyrocopter on the U.S. Capitol lawn. You know, there's two things that come out of this right away. People saying, wasn't Washington, D.C. supposed to be the most protected place in the world? And apparently, they even knew about this guy. And then I guess there's the other side of that argument where some people are saying, why didn't you shoot him down? Yeah. Oh, that was my first reaction. I mean, why didn't you shoot him down? I, I, this is completely outrageous, and it, it seems to confirm what everybody thinks about the Obama administration and security at the White House and national security. I mean, I, I cannot figure out how you could let some Yahoo land a gyrocopter on the White House lawn, uh, you know, and just assume that all he had in it were letters. I mean, what if he had had something else in it? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. Maybe they had, you know, trailed the gyrocopter and, you know, somehow scanned it for any dangerous materials. But, but this, to me, I think is outrageous. And I think most people looking at this, you know, have to be shaking their heads. Well, let's get down to that. And, and you kind of answered it a little bit, but I just thought I'd ask you flat out. If you're sitting there and you're in charge of security, do you shoot him down? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> like I said, I am, I am not an expert in security, but I, I can't figure out how you can be so sure that this man is not going to do serious harm. Dan, I'll tell you, there's an argument to be made for that because he's just got letters in his pocket, but you can carry anything on these copters. So why not just, you see him coming, shoot him. Sure, absolutely. This guy wanted to bring attention to campaign finance reform. Uh, this, I mean, he's obviously whacked out kind of guy. Um, but unintentionally, he seemed to bring more attention to security issues and the issues of drones in particular. We talk about drones. What we think of is we think of drones flying over uh, parts of the Middle East and dropping bombs on people and, and shooting at terrorists. But here we have something, and not necessarily a drone, so to speak, but the same kind of concept. And uh, it can be used to deliver mail but it also can be used to deliver bombs. Now, this one in particular, I don't believe it, it landed on the White House. That happened before, too. This one landed uh, near the Capitol building. Um, so there's probably was a lot less chance to actually shoot it down than there would have been if White House snipers had seen it flying over. But isn't that, that a little bit disconcerting right there, Dan, if you think about it? Because while you're right about the difference in buildings, you're still talking about the nation's capital, where the lawmakers, where the president, where other people are. This is supposed to be the most sacrosanct protected airspace in the world. Turns out you can sneak it through. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know where exactly this guy started his, his gyro copter from uh, actually but, you know, started in the Pennsylvania. National Mall, so to speak. It, did, he, did he fly it all the way from Pennsylvania to the National Mall? Flew it all the way there, apparently. We don't know whether it was in one hop or whether we stopped, but he started at a small airport in Pennsylvania, we understand, and he just flew it right in, which means that NORAD says they couldn't pick him up because he's too small, too small a target, but still, you could see this guy coming from a long ways away. It's not like it was a shock. <laughs> I mean, you have you well, have that's airplanes. That's mind-boggling, you know, but I, I do understand pilots, that. Excuse, sorry, announcing that you know flights out of Washington, you used to not be able to get up to go to the bathroom, you know, according to TSA regulations, because of concerns about security in the airspace over Washington, and then this happens. I mean, it it also sort of to me points out just the inconsistencies of these regulations, and makes me wonder just how effective the security really is. And not only that, Dan, but they knew this but remember, guy was a out there. But remember, gyrocopter is not a gyrocopter is not an airplane. An airplane is very large. NORAD has the ability to see every single one of those and it does raise concern and NORAD and everybody else at the FAA is going to have to start taking these things as a serious threat and is going to have to create the technology where they can where they can find these things. They're, they're tiny. I mean this thing is not big. It's, I, I, you know, I've never seen one in person. My sense is it's not the size of an airplane. Well, we're so opening this up to, to a lot of things, though, Dan, if you think about it, because you're right. It's not a, a big NORAD deal. It is the FAA. There's radar. There's many other things. You're talking about a drone society we live in right now where almost anything can be delivered mm -hmm. with a drone. So now you're looking at, again, we come back to that question. Here he is coming. You can see him. There's not supposed to be anything in the air. So as Naomi said, shoot him down. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, personally, I don't know. Are there snipers on the Capitol Dome? Or uh, where are the closest um, 
or, or I mean, do you launch a missile? I don't know how the <laughs> logistics of that would actually work. At the White House, like I said, you have snipers. You have ways to, to mm -hmm. take this thing out of the air. Uh, on the National Mall and at the Capitol, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you do. Um, it's it's, it's something you're going to have to figure out because there are going the to be more drones in the air out. than less. Well, think about it this way, because you but, have law enforcement there at least, so maybe we are going to wind up having to have snipers in on all these buildings. It's possible. I mean, it, like I said, there are going to be more drones, not less of them. And the worst thing about all this is now this could have potentially given terrorists, other bad guys, ideas and, and ideas on what to do and just how secure our, our national federal buildings are. And that's very, very bad if they see this and think to themselves, hmm, that's not a bad idea. There, I think, is exactly the key. What you're talking about is the fact that now, if you look at it, this has gone around the world, it's viral, and you have somebody sitting somewhere in a, in a hut somewhere around the world going, it's not a bad idea. Look at that. Now we can get a gyrocopter in. It's, it's all just part of the whole security <laughs> issue. You're right. Yeah. Dan and Naomi, please hang on just a couple of moments because we've got to take a break and come back. And when we do, th there's a couple of things that we need to cover here, including what is it about the need to shoot an animal and then pose next to it and smile? Ricky Gervais didn't like it. You'll find out why when we come back in the arena on Midpoint. The arena continues. Veteran columnist for the New York Post, Naomi Schaefer Riley. Man on the street for the Media Research Center, Dan Joseph. Dan, this one comes to you first. Rebecca Francis is co host of a show called Eye of the Hunter, where they like to go out and shoot animals for fun, including mostly big game. She posted a shot of herself next to a giraffe that she had just killed, and she was smiling. Ricky Gervais got a hold of this. He tweeted this out. It has blown up around the world right now. She's getting an awful lot of heat for this. Look, she says that it was an older animal. They asked her to kill it. He wasn't going to breed anymore. But do you have to actually sit there next to it and smile? Come on. This is ridiculous. No. No, I think it's in very bad taste. As, as somebody who's not a hunter myself, it's hard for me to get into the mindset of people who do hunt, particularly people who hunt rare and exotic animals, especially animals that are not a danger to anyone. I mean, it doesn't seem like the giraffe is likely to be attacking somebody. You know, if you shoot a lion or a, or a tiger in the wilds of Africa, that's one thing. This just looks very bad. And, and, but it also shows you the, the outrage over it. Uh, shows you a lot of how our society has changed, especially with the inter in the internet age. I mean. 80, even 50 years ago, this kind of big game hunting was seen as an honorable thing to do. You think back to Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, he had heads of all sorts of crazy animals on his walls. Today, though, society has changed in the sense that it is no longer seen as something to be proud of if you are killing exotic animals. And a lot of people would say animals at all just for sport. Again, I don't really see the sport in shooting at something as large as a giraffe. Uh, unless it was running towards you at, you know, 100 miles an hour. Well, so look at it this way, too. In, in a lot of these instances, too, Naomi, a lot of these hunters are out there, and it's basically controlled game shoots. It's not as if they have to go out and hunt them down. They actually sit there, and they are prepared for them to shoot. And this woman's actually killed an endangered black rhino before. I mean, if you're going to kill it for food, I get it, that's one thing. But then to sit there and actually smile about it and be proud, I think that's rather despicable. I guess I just can't get too worked up about it. I mean, yes, it seems to me that the it seems to me that the selfie is kind of the selfie with the dying giraffe is in bad taste. But I mean, you know, there this country is filled with people who hunt for sport, and and you could say, oh well, we have to make it. You know, we have to use the animal for a particular, you know, for food or for clothing. I mean, you know, we don't do that anymore. Nobody needs nobody needs to kill a wild animal for clothing or for food anymore. So I don't I don't know where you're gonna put the standard here. It seems to me that, yeah, you know, what this in the United is, States is killing giraffes for fun. I mean, the, the giraffe in the United States is an animal that's at the zoo. People watch them. They love them. Giraffes, so it's not black rhinos, elephants. not surprising in this country elephants. this was met with outrage. You know, all of no, these I, different I, endangered look, species. I, I agree yeah. with you. I, I think that the picture is in bad taste, but I just, I, I don't know why you know, if, if it's not, I understand if it's an endangered species, you know, this is against the law, that's a problem. But if it's not an endangered species, I guess I don't see, I understand why people are sad about the giraffe, but, you know, are, are we, is the, is the idea we're going to ban hunting now? Because, you know, we don't no, think the I don't the think it's banning are, hunting. I, I think what it is, it's almost the glee that goes with it. I think that had well, people a little I mean, bit caught off. Why do you think people hunt? I mean, people hunt because it makes them happy to go out and try to shoot an animal. I mean, I think... 
Maybe we and like need you to said, kind of Ed, I mean, is this really hunting? Lunch. They put them sort of in this farm and they bring the animals to them and then they can run around the little reserve and shoot them if they want to. That's not really hunting. That's like a giraffe death camp of some sort. Now, see what I think, and, and you're right. See, what I think is hunting is if you go out into the plain of Africa somewhere and if there's a possibility that you may be eaten by the prey, yeah. that you are hunting, Do it yourself. That then yeah, that's but, hunting. But then, of course, the only reason that you're going there is because you could put yourself in that kind of danger. I mean, I just... I think the idea that hunting is something that's necessary or that shooting an animal is something that's necessary to protect yourself is just it's just not a modern notion. And I don't to tell you the truth, I don't think, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was engaged in that kind of hunting either. He didn't uh, I need think to you're kill right. animals for food. I do think you're right. All right, time ago though. Let's move on. We got a couple other things here. A twenty seven year old could become the first transgender cover model for men's health magazine. It's their annual ultimate men's health guy. So putting a transgender up on men's health. Naomi, what do you think? I, I can't imagine it's going to sell magazines, but what do I know? I, can't, I, mean, I can't imagine a lot of guys who basically would do it would buy the magazine, but people would say, why not? I, I guess it makes news. I mean, they're certainly in the news, but, uh, but I would guess this is a kind of one-off for men's health. I wouldn't guess that they're going to go back and do this I, again. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of... The details here. Is he transgender just means he thinks he's a, a woman? No, or he, he is, no, he as a is woman, transgender. Or does it mean he doesn't have male parts? No, he What's is, that? He is, he is a transgender. He has tattoos. In this, I'm quoting from the Washington Post. Tattoos, beard, six-pack abs. He is the first transgender man, possibly, to grace the cover of men's health. So, yes, he is transgender. Okay, so my understanding is that people are taking votes on this. The Men's Health yes. magazine is actually getting regular people to vote. Well, this shows you the power of the gay rights movement in this country, actually, because what I'm, what I'm guessing is that the gay rights movement in certain sectors are promoting this guy and telling their followers, vote for this guy, let's make a statement, let's put him on the cover of Men's Health, and uh, it, it could potentially work. I mean, I think it might be a little bit of an embarrassment for Men's Health if they have a guy, you know, wearing a wig and, and, and doing all sorts of... Chelsea Manning kind of stuff on there, but you know, that's the way it goes. You got to be very careful if you're asking for people's opinion and you're going to, you know, abide by what they say in some sort of internet vote. Very well, I'll tell you what, online voters have taken him to the top at this point, so we're going to find out what happens. We'll follow the story and see what men's health does from here, but it is great publicity either way, let's put it this way. All right, here we go. That's There's true. a new study out that says the first person to live to the age of 1,000 is likely walking among us right now, thanks to medical advances, if you will. Dan, with all the people that you have interviewed from time to time at MRC, and I've seen some of the idiotic responses you've gotten back, do you really want to put up with this for another 950 years? Would you want to live to be 1,000? <laughs> well, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Would you really want to live to be 1,000 years old? I mean, I've always sort of dreamed of being a time traveler to see what happens in the future, but I just don't know if I want to wait that long for it. If it's, it, it, look, I don't know. I'm, I'm very skeptical about this technology, that there's somebody here who could actually live to be 1,000 years old. Um, but you know what? If you could push it to like 200, that would be very impressive. I might actually go for that. But then again, a thousand years you have to see, you have to sit there and watch as all your friends and your family pass away. Uh, it probably well, but have, think of the uh, good side of all this, though. Dan, think of all the Netflix marathons that you can watch. I mean, the <laughs> possibilities are just. You endless. might finally get to see the Cubs win a World Series. See, that might be the the biggest. Now I don't know if I'm going to go this. that far. I think you better stop right there, young man, because I think you're going over the edge. Uh, I'll get, <laughs> yeah, I'll get letters from my Cubs fans, friends like crazy. So Naomi, would you want to live to be a thousand? No, I would not. But I mean, just imagine the health care costs for this. I mean, if we're having discussions about end of life care now, just wait till we have to cover from ages 800 to 1000. I mean, it, it, it I don't know. I, I, I think this is um, still a little bit science fiction at this point. What would you could, would you do? The Obamacare though? death panels are going to be working really, really hard <laughs> exactly. once this goes into effect. <laughs> oh, please Long don't hours. don't start death panels again, please. Let's let's walk away no, no, from no, that no. for a moment. Uh, Naomi, if you could live a thousand years, would you do it in an artificial body, though? let's say. Oh, so you get to be a thousand but not actually have to experience aging? Right. Maybe um, get to I, be artificial intelligence? I bet you there are a lot of people who would take you up on that offer. <laughs> See, that's easy. How about it, Dan? That's, that doesn't sound bad. Then there's fewer oh, yeah. wrinkles. If I'm a thousand years old, I do not want to look a thousand years old. I want to look <laughs> like I'm at least in my mid-thirties, at the most, you know, fifties or sixties. Once you hit seventy, I don't want to be in that body 
for the next, this, you know, nine years. This is a way for Hillary Clinton to years. keep That just doesn't appeal to me. Wait a minute. Hold it. I only got a couple seconds. Say that again, Naomi. You got I the said shot. Go ahead. This is a way for Hillary Clinton to keep running for president. I knew it. I knew somebody was going to come up <laughs> with a joke Their whole generations of their family could run for president right? uh, forever and ever. We're all going to go out, have it nipped and tucked and everything else. We're going to have it done as long as we look good. It's the most important thing. <laughs> Uh, Dan Joseph, Naomi Schaefer Riley, it's been an awful lot of fun. Don't forget Naomi's book, Got Religion, How Churches, Mosques, and Synagogues Can Bring Young People Back. Don't worry about being young. We're going to live to 1,000 anyway. There you go. Both of you, thank you so much for joining us. We'll look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. All right, take care. Uh, would you want to live to be 1,000? Well, at least live a few minutes more because join us when we return on Midpoint.